Classification of matter, section 1.2. Uh, scientists love to classify things. Um, this is like a little kid playing with Legos, right? And you can, you can classify Legos in lots of different ways, right? You could put them in different piles by color. You could classify them by shapes. You, know, you could put the, the ones that are the regular height or the ones that are shorter. You could classify them by types of special pieces or sets that they came from. There's lots of different ways to classify Legos. And there's also lots of different ways to classify matter. So we'll be looking at some of those. So we can take matter. Remember, matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. And we can separate that into two categories, a pure substance or a mixture. Now, the textbook that we use in 1A always talks about pure substance as opposed to just substance. This book uses the expression substance. And what they mean by substance is something that is just composed of one kind of, kind of thing. So a substance, a pure substance, is a form of matter that has definite composition and distinct properties. So the composition of it always is the same. And its properties are always the same. So let's think of some possible examples of a pure substance. Something that's always the same. How about, yeah, oxygen. So there is oxygen in the air. It's a good thing, too, or we'd all be on the floor. So oxygen. Oxygen is a pure substance. The oxygen that is in the air is actually a diatomic molecule, two oxygen atoms bonded together. But you look at oxygen in the air here, or if you go to the White House and sample the oxygen in the Oval Office, or you go you know, to the wilds of Africa, or, or wherever you go, oxygen is always oxygen. It's always the same. Two atoms of oxygen bonded together always has the same properties. Okay, we breathe it, and it helps us to stay alive. Um, it's a gas at room temperature, etc. How about water? Is water a pure substance? Well, it kind of depends on how you use the term water. The water that comes out of the faucet is not pure water. So in, in science, we often will call that tap water. That has other things in it. And tap water can vary from, from city to city. Some places have water that smells, tastes like sulfur. Um, other cities like Fresno, the water's pretty good. But they stick chlorine in there, and they may stick fluoride in there. And there's other things in the water. But water, as a chemical, is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And it's always exactly the same. And so water is considered a pure substance, even though it's two different, two different elements. Um, ethanol. Ethanol is an alcohol. That is the alcohol that is in um, alcoholic beverages, like in beer and wine, um, vodka, et cetera. All of those are mixtures. They're not pure substances, but they contain alcohol, and that ethanol is always the same composition. Okay. Pure substances can be elements, or they can be compounds. So ethanol and water are both compounds. Oxygen is an element. Can we think of another element that's a pure substance? Yeah. Helium. So you put helium in a balloon. It's individual helium atoms. How about the aluminum in this aluminum can? Is aluminum a pure substance? Yeah, it is. Now that's got you know ink and stuff on the outside, but it's a pure substance. Aluminum. to pure substances. So we can have mixtures, we can have pure substances, and then pure substances can be elements or compounds. I'm feeling, OK, I'm like we have more to talk about. Um, 
we're going to talk more about the elements and the compounds, but first we're going to talk about states of matter. So matter exists in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Um, and yes, there is a fourth state called a plasma, but we're not going to get into that. So we're going to talk about solid, liquid, and gas. Now, water's kind of nice because we are familiar with water in all three states. And so here we have a photograph. Here we have liquid water in a beaker, and we're boiling it. So there's the liquid. When, when you boil water, it goes into the gas state. And so you can see up here um, the water vapor, water in the gas state. And then here we have some ice cubes sitting on a watch glass. Ice is solid water. So we have the three different states, solid, liquid, and gas. Here we have illustrations of the three different states. And what makes them different is the amount of freedom of movement that the particles have and the distance between the individual particles in, in that substance. So in a solid, the particles are um, what we call touchingly close. They're touching each other, basically. right? They're very close together. And they don't have much freedom of movement. It turns out that all substances, all particles, are moving. None, nothing is absolutely still. But these particles are not moving relative to each other. They're basically just vibrating. They're just wiggling in place. And I talk about the three states of matter. There's three states of students. Right now, you guys are in the solid state. So we're close together in this classroom, right? Are you moving? Well, not relative to the person next to you, but are you breathing? I hope you are. Some of you are taking notes or fidgeting, you know, whatever. We're moving, but we're not moving relative to each other. And so in a solid, the particles are close together, and they're moving, but not relative to each other. In a liquid, the particles are still close together, but now they do move relative to each other. So the, the liquid states of state of students is perhaps during activity session or, or during a chemistry lab or when class first gets started and we're milling about. We're still close together, but now we're moving relative to each other. And that's what happens in the liquid state. And then the gas state, there's a lot of distance between the individual particles and they're moving relative to each other. This is when class lets out and you guys go out the door and you go off in opposite directions, right? And there's a lot of space between us, and that's the gas state of students. Okay, any questions? Yeah, in a liquid, the particles are still very close, touchingly close, but now, you know, these, these guys are just sliding around. Have you seen those videos of puppies? You know, you got like 12 puppies crawling on a child, right? These atoms, these particles here are like the puppies. They're just squirming and, and swirling around. They're moving, but they're still close to each other. So that's what happens in a liquid. And this idea explains the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. If you have a liquid and, and you pour the container, what happens to the liquid? It changes its shape and it pours out of the container, right? But its volume stays the same. If you do that with a solid, like here we have a solid block of whatever this red stuff is in this flask, and we pour it, that chunk will come out, but it's going to keep its same shape, right? It's not going to change its shape. And then gases are really weird because gases, they'll change their shape and their volume. A gas will expand to fill its container, no matter how large the container is. So that's kind of an overview of states of matter. So let's get back to elements and compounds. So an element is a substance that cannot be separated into simpler substances by a chemical means. So you can't do a chemical reaction and break it into smaller things, simpler things. So by chemical means excludes nuclear reactions. You can take an element and break it into smaller elements 
by a nuclear reaction. But we're not going to be going into nuclear reactions in this class, so we're going to ignore them. Okay. So most of the elements that exist occur naturally. They can be found somewhere on the planet. Um, but there are some that are man-made. Okay, and those, those that are man-made are made through nuclear processes. So we have a periodic table up on the wall here. And uh, most of the elements are, are naturally occurring. Um, some of the ones at the very end, and they've, they've just named some new ones, um, those have been made in laboratories. Um, so we use chemical symbols to represent the elements, because the names get kind of long and tedious sometimes. Chemical symbols are one or two letters, always. One or two. The first letter is always capitalized. The second letter, if there is one, never capitalized. Some of the symbols come from the English names, and so we have C is the symbol for carbon. C is the first letter of the word carbon. Some of the symbols come from the Latin names for the elements. So we've used C for carbon, and CA stands for calcium, and CO stands for cobalt, and so what do we do with copper? Well, we use the Latin name cuprum, and the symbol for copper is CU which, you know, gives students fits because there's no U in the word copper. Okay, so some of these symbols that don't seem to make sense, they're from the Latin words because Latin was used in science before English was. And so things like mercury and um, sodium, potassium, um, a lot of those elements where the symbols don't seem to match up with their names, it's because they are based on the Latin names. So there will be a list of element symbols that you need to memorize, okay? And we've all managed to learn the alphabet, so I'm sure we can manage to memorize some element symbols. A compound is also a pure substance. Water is a compound. But you can break a compound down into simpler substances chemically. Water can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, the two elements, by passing electric current through it. You can do this even with a 9-volt battery and a cup of tap water. And you'll see some bubbles forming, and it's oxygen at one terminal and hydrogen at the other. And you're taking water, and you're breaking it into the two individual elements. You can't take hydrogen gas or oxygen gas and chemically break it into anything simpler. It's as simple as it gets. So I think of elements, and specifically the atoms, which are the small particles of elements, as being a lot like Lego blocks. Okay? So could you cut a Lego block in half? Like if you had a bandsaw, could you cut a Lego block in half? Sure. How many seven-year-olds have a bandsaw to cut Legos in half? Nobody does that. That's the equivalent of a nuclear process. With your bare hands, and reasonable strength. Can you break Lego blocks, the individual blocks, into smaller blocks? No. No, you can't. If you have some Legos combined into a little structure, can you take that apart with your hands? Yes, you can. So the Lego blocks stuck together is like a compound. We've made something out of the individual building blocks. The elements are the individual building blocks. Okay, so compound can be broken into simpler substances by chemical means. So if we have a chemical reaction, it will come apart. But we can't separate it by a physical separation. You can't take pure water and filter it and make oxygen and hydrogen. You have to do a chemical reaction to do that. Boiling it, freezing it, nothing like that is going to cause it to change into the elements. Another important thing about compounds is the properties of the compound is very different from the elements that it's made of. So let's think about water. So water is formed from oxygen and hydrogen. So if you had, you know, a campfire and you wanted to put it out, 
Would you pour hydrogen on it? No. Hydrogen is a very flammable gas. You've heard of the Hindenburg? Large dirigible, big blimp full of hydrogen gas. Came across the Atlantic, then exploded as it was landing, right? Burned up. Horrible tragedy. Hydrogen is flammable. Oxygen technically is not flammable, but it is necessary for anything else to burn. So you're also not going to want to pour oxygen gas on a campfire to put it out. Then why do we pour water on a campfire? The properties of water are very different than the properties of the elements that, it are made, are, uh, that it's made of. Water is a liquid at room temperature. Hydrogen and oxygen are gases. Water can be used to put out fire. Water is not flammable. It does not burn. Okay? So when you make a compound, the properties change. And then mixtures. So we, we've been talking about pure substances, elements and compounds, and then there's mixtures. And mixture is what you think of as a mixture. You put some things together, you mix it up. Right? It's a combination of two or more substances in which the substances retain their own distinct properties. So if you take flour and salt and mix it together, the salt part still tastes salty, right? And the flour part still has the property of flour. That make sense? If you mix hydrogen and oxygen gas, do they become water? No. We used to do this demonstration at the, the science show we did in college, and you put a, a balloon full of hydrogen gas and a balloon full of oxygen gas and a balloon full of hydrogen and oxygen gas mixed together. Mixing them together doesn't make water. The, the oxygen gas balloon, when you light it with a match, goes kaboom. And the hydrogen gas one goes kaboom. And the one that's got to mix together goes kaboom. And all the ceiling tiles in the lecture hall bumped up. And we're like, oh, guess we made that one too big. Okay. Mixing them together, they still have their properties of being flammable. When you chemically combine them into a compound, then their properties change. So in a mixture, the components still have their own properties. And a mixture can be separated by physical means. And the composition can vary. So in water, we always have two hydrogens and one oxygen atom. In a mixture, you could have a little bit of hydrogen and a lot of oxygen or equal amounts, or any different combination. And of course, you know, I told you, we like to categorize things. So we can take mixtures and categorize those as well, classify them. Two kinds of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. We use a lot of prefixes and suffixes in chemistry. The prefix homo means the same. The prefix hetero means different. So homogeneous means that the, the components of the mixture are thoroughly mixed. It's uniform throughout. So let's see if we can think of an example of a homogeneous mixture. Let's think of food, right, because it's, it's getting to be lunchtime. What if I put um, sugar in, in a cup of water and stirred it up? Would that mix together nicely? Yeah. You add a little flavor and some food coloring, you call it Kool-Aid, right? And the top of the Kool-Aid glass tastes the same as the bottom of the Kool-Aid glass. It mixes thoroughly. So sugar in water would make a homogeneous mixture. Um, let's think about soup. Can you think of a soup that's the same throughout? Tomato soup. Yeah, tomato soup. Okay. It's been all blended, right? And so there aren't any chunks, right? So a cream soup like tomato soup or a clear broth would be um, a homogeneous mixture. So this sugar and water, I could put one teaspoon of sugar in the water or I could put half a cup of sugar in the water. The composition varies. Could I separate the sugar from the water? 
yeah, it takes a little thinking. What if I let all the water evaporate? What would be left? The sugar. The water's still water. The sugar is still sugar. Okay. You can't do that with a compound. You can't separate things that way. Heterogeneous mixture, um, not uniform. What if I took and um, put some, some olive oil in water? Is that going to mix together nicely? No. What's going to happen? The oil's going to sit on top, right? You add, add a few more things in there and some vinegar, and you call that Italian salad dressing, right? You shake it up, and then you set it down and watch it, and it, it separates. It's a heterogeneous mixture. There's distinct areas. Let's think of a soup that would be heterogeneous. Minestrone. Minestrone. Now, probably not everybody knows what minestrone soup is, but it's got, it's got vegetables like green beans and things in it, and it's got little chunks of meat and noodles and uh, like garbanzo beans, or how about something like chicken noodle soup? That might be a little more familiar. Chicken noodle soup. You've got the, the chicken broth, and you've got the little pieces of chicken, and you've got the noodles, right? It's not uniform. You can see there's different areas that are different, OK? Something like that is pretty easy to separate the noodles from the broth, right? You just run it through a strainer. Um, you'll catch the chicken and the noodles, and then you can just pick them, pick them apart, and you could separate them. Here's, here's another type of mixture. This is a heterogeneous mixture. We've got sand and iron filings. And when you look at this mixture, you can see there's the dark specks of the iron filings, and then there's the sand. It's a mixture. They retain their own properties. Iron filings are attracted to a magnet. Sand particles are not. And so we take this magnet and stick it down in here, and you can separate the iron filings from the sand that way. OK, so let's see what we've learned here. Here we have four different illustrations. And we want to identify these as element, compound, or mixture. So this first one here, is that an element, a compound, or a mixture? Compound or element, OK, is, is not a mixture, right? Well, let's look at this a little more carefully. Um, each of these pieces in it looks like it's composed of two blue balls, right? So those would be two, um, I guess it would be nitrogen, nitrogen atoms. Blue is usually for nitrogen. And so these are all the same. And so this is definitely a pure substance. But there's only one kind of little ball in here. And so this is an element. And I, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to get that one right off the bat. That one's an element. There's only one kind of atom. OK? How about this one? That one's easier. That one's an element. Here we have yellow, yellow little balls, right? That's an element. How about this one? There's a mixture. So we have, we have the yellow balls, and we have these blue things that we had over here, and then we've got these fun, funky things. There's different kinds of particles. Over here, all the particles were the same. That's what's true in a pure substance. All the particles are the same. Here we have different kinds of particles, and so that is a mixture. What about this one? That's a compound. Each of the particles is the same as the others. They all have four green balls and one red ball, or three. Three green balls and one red ball. So it's a pure substance. But we have two different kinds of balls in here, two different kinds of elements. We have the red one and the green one. And so that's a compound. It's not a mixture because it's a, a fixed or constant composition. There's three greens to one red throughout the whole thing. Any questions? <clears throat>